Hi there, my name is Jake, not Jack, and today I want to go over interstitial cystitis, how it's related to mast cell activation syndrome, and some treatments that may be helpful. This one's probably going to be a longer one, so I'm going to put timestamps in the video description box and along the bottom bar so you can skip ahead to each chapter if you want. So what is interstitial cystitis? Well, let's first break down the word. So cystitis has the cyst part of the word, which refers to the bladder, and the itis refers to inflammation. Interstitial tissue is a type of connective or supportive tissue, so interstitial cystitis, or IC, is inflammation of the bladder wall. Being diagnosed with interstitial cystitis is basically like being diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome, but of the bladder. You could call it irritable bladder syndrome, but IBS is already taken. It's also called painful bladder syndrome, or PBS, which I hate to tell them, that's already taken too. So you'll see in the scientific literature this syndrome being called IC slash PBS. More women, in fact, 15 times more women than men have interstitial cystitis. In the United States, it's estimated that 1.2 million women, but only 82,000 men have IC. There's a lot of overlap between IBS and IC. Just like IBS with IC, the symptoms are very real, but there is no known cause or known cure, so the diagnosis itself isn't super illuminating. And just like with IBS, symptoms can be managed with diet and lifestyle changes. And both IC and IBS patients can benefit from some of the same drugs, including antihistamines, mast cell targeted therapies, and using antidepressants off-label for their antihistamine and analgesic effects. Analgesic has the word anal in it. And many people who are diagnosed with IC are also diagnosed with IBS. So what does IC feel like? Well, the symptoms can range from mild to absolutely debilitating, and each person has different symptoms. And the symptoms can be similar to a UTI. I would say that my symptoms, in comparison to what I know that they could be, are mild. My main symptom is mild discomfort in my bladder every day, especially when my bladder is too full or too empty or my urine is very not diluted. And I only rarely ever have spasming, and that happens when my urine is very not diluted. Some other symptoms of IC, which thankfully I do not have, include pain in the perineum, which is the space between either the vagina or scrotum and the anus, which is also called by its medical term, the taint or the gooch. Good thing my late grandma isn't here for that joke. A persistent and urgent need to urinate, frequent urination, pain or discomfort while the bladder fills, Pain during urination, urinary hesitancy, which is basically the difficulty of starting your stream, having to urinate often in the urine of the night. <laughs> Christy! Phantom. For I compose the urine of the night. I actually do compose the urine of the night. <laughs> Every night. Urinary incontinence and pain during sexual intercourse. It's important to note that many of these symptoms could be indicative of many other issues like UTIs, but also sexually transmitted infections, endometriosis, bladder cancer, and more. So it's really important that you're getting a correct diagnosis and you and or your caregiver are going to be your own best advocates. I see bumps the pain up of UTIs several notches as if UTIs weren't already painful enough. I remember waking up from a deep slumber at 5.30 a.m. and having to wait until 8 a.m. for the urgent care near my house to open. I paced back and forth from my bathroom, across the hallway, into my mom's room, and back again for basically two and a half hours moaning and groaning. This is back when I could still pace. Now that I can only stand for 15 minutes a day, I exercise by running my mouth since it's the only thing I can run, use it or lose it, baby. The cause of IC is unknown, and that's probably because there is more than one cause. I think for a lot of poorly understood syndromes, there is probably more than one cause, and that's part of the reason why it's poorly understood. IC is increasingly becoming recognized as a part of mast cell activation syndrome, or at least mast cell mediated, and that makes total sense. If you aren't familiar with mast cell activation syndrome, I have previous videos, and I'll put that in the video description box. We know that mast cells are most prevalent in the tissues that have the most contact with the outside world, so that includes your skin, your GI tract, and your genitourinary tract. And since these are the tissues where mast cells are most prevalent, it makes sense that this is where MCAS patients experience the most amount of symptoms. 
Dr. Theo Herides, and that's as good as my pronunciation is going to get, is a medical doctor and PhD who has done a lot of research on mast cell activation syndrome in general, but also the role that the mast cell plays in interstitial cystitis, and he has a model for that, so I'm going to put that up on the screen. At the top, you will see urothelial dysfunction, which refers to increased permeability of the lining of the urinary tract. We already know that intestinal permeability, aka leaky gut, is a factor in the development of many diseases such as Crohn's disease, rheumatoid arthritis, and IBS. So this leaky bladder, so to speak, contributes to the release of neurotransmitters. This in turn leads to mast cell activation and nerve excitation, which in turn leads to central nervous system and spinal cord wind up, which then leads to pain or heightened pain actually in the urinary tract, but also adjacent areas of the gynecologic area, pelvic floor, and even the GI tract. This explains why many people with IC have symptoms in these adjacent areas, and this is a vicious cycle or loop. So what is Dr. Theo Herides based this model on? Well, for one, we know that tryptase is an inflammatory mediator released by mast cells, and it has been found that those with IC have elevated levels of tryptase. Some studies have found that biopsies of the bladder that have more than 20 mast cells per millimeter squared is actually a fairly good indicator of IC. One study found that IC patients were significantly more likely to be diagnosed with IBS, which is another syndrome in which there are elevated counts of mast cells just in the GI tract. Many women with both MCAS and interstitial cystitis find that their symptoms fluctuate with their hormones throughout their menstrual cycle, and research has shown that mast cells from women with IC have a higher expression of estrogen receptors. And in a study of guinea pigs, estrogen have been shown to increase the proliferation of bladder mast cells. Fun fact about me, when I was four, I convinced the hairdresser at the kids' salon that my middle name was guinea pig. So when she brought me out to see my mom at the end of my haircut, she really had to ask my mom if my name was Jake Guinea Pig Picker. I wish it was. My real middle name is just the letter T. I'm not joking. It really is just the letter T. No period. Just T. Jake T. Picker. We also know that patients with IC have increased histamine levels in their bladder wall. Did you know that cats develop a very similar presentation of IC to that of humans? And in these cats, they also have an increased number of mast cells in their bladder. My best friend's cat has IC and she has to put tuna flavoring in the cat's water to get him to drink more water, which incidentally is what my mom also has to do for me. Cheers! Mmm, or should I say, Meow. Meow, meow. Meow. So what are some ways of managing IC? I would say that the first and easiest place to start is through diet and lifestyle changes. I manage my IC by drinking a lot of water because diluting your urine can make it less irritating to the bladder, and I also make sure that I don't hold my pee for too long, which makes me a great joy on road trips. I also avoid my triggers, so prior to developing full-blown debilitating MCAS, my main trigger for my IC was caffeine. That didn't mean I didn't drink caffeine, so technically I didn't avoid my trigger, I just followed up my trigger with a shit ton of water. <laughs> Some common triggers for IC, which incidentally are also common triggers for MCAS, include alcohol, soda, carbonated drinks, citrus, tomatoes, spicy foods, and artificial sweeteners. You will need to identify these for yourself using trial and error. Other lifestyle changes include wearing loose and comfortable clothing, exercising, eating more healthily, reducing stress, stopping smoking, and just leading a healthier lifestyle overall. Another tip is to avoid UTIs at all costs. After you make this mistake once, you won't need reminding. This isn't a comprehensive list by any means, but some tips for avoiding UTIs include urinating pretty soon after intercourse, drinking plenty of water, and always wiping from front to back. There are a lot of medications that are used for the management of IC, including over-the-counter meds, prescription meds, supplements, and bladder installations. The four oral medications that have been studied the most for interstitial cystitis include pentosan polysulfate sodium, or pentosan, amitriptyline, cimetidine, and hydroxyzine. You will notice that all of these classes of medications are also medications that are used for the management of MCAS. And you will notice that IC 
they recommend that you use a multi-medication approach, which is also what is recommended for MCAS. Since there are so many medication options for just IC alone, I'm going to focus on the ones that are also used for the management of MCAS. Pentasan is the only oral therapy approved by the FDA for IC. Pentasan can be given orally or through bladder installation, but the mechanism by which Pentasan works is unknown. One hypothesis is that the pentasan creates a protective coating for the bladder wall and makes it less permeable, aka less leaky. But it's also an anticoagulant, so perhaps that relieves pain. Another proposed mechanism is that pentasan can inhibit the release of histamine from mast cells, and that's been shown with experimental studies. Amitriptyline has been shown to reduce symptoms of IC. Amitriptyline is a tricyclic antidepressant, or TCA, and these were some of the first antidepressants developed. Because they have less targeted effects than newer antidepressants like SSRIs, they are often prescribed for conditions other than depression, like pain conditions, or they're even used as antihistamines. One of the ways in which amitriptyline might work for IC is through its H1 blocking capacity. And in fact, amitriptyline is one of the strongest H1 blockers that we have. So doxepin is also a TCA and it's actually even stronger of an H1 blocker than amitriptyline. And it's used in the treatment of MCAS. Doxepin isn't listed on mainstream websites as a treatment option for IC, but I'm of the opinion that it could be helpful in some patients with IC, given what we know about amitriptyline and doxepin and their antihistamine effects. Amitriptyline and other TCAs have anticholinergic effects, which can help relax the bladder and decrease bladder contractions. TCAs also block the reuptake of certain neurotransmitters like noradrenaline and serotonin, and this can help decrease pain signaling. And finally, TCAs have sedative properties, which may help you sleep through the night without rude interruptions by your bladder. According to the Interstitial Cystitis Association, you can also get a topical form of amitriptyline. The website didn't really say where you're supposed to put this topical medication, so if you've used this before, leave me a comment down below and tell me where you rub it. That didn't sound right. Hydroxyzine is an H1 blocker, and H1 blockers are what we generally think of when we think of antihistamines. Hydroxyzine is a first-generation H1 blocker, which means that it's more likely to make you drowsy than a second-generation H1 blocker, like Zyrtec, for example. Hydroxyzine can be taken at bedtime to help with the mast cell activation syndrome component and to help you sleep through the night. However, if hydroxyzine doesn't work for you because you react to it or it makes you too drowsy or something, I think it's worth asking your doctor about other H1 blockers. Just because you react to a drug of one class and you have MCAS, that doesn't mean that you'll react or um, have bad side effects from all drugs of that class. One study has shown that cimetidine, aka Tagamet, improved suprapubic Super pubic. Super pubic to the rescue! So Tagamet improved suprapubic pain and frequent urination at night. And if we are thinking that IC is a part of MCAS, well, this makes perfect sense because H2 blockers along with H1 blockers form the foundation for most, or many, no most, MCAS patients. Even though other H2 blockers have not been studied in the context of IC, I think it is possible, or actually in my opinion probable, that other H2 blockers like Pepsid could be helpful for some with IC. RIP Zantac. Pain management in IC is huge. And don't let your doctor fob you off on that one. People need to stand up for themselves. They do? Yeah. 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 Some people find NSAIDs to be helpful in the management of their pain in IC, and that makes sense because those are anti-inflammatories, and as we've been over, IC is basically an inflamed bladder. In the treatment of MCAS, NSAIDs can be very helpful for some, but in others, it can induce anaphylaxis. So, uh, be careful? So, do NSAIDs help IC symptoms merely because of their anti-inflammatory effects, or do they help IC patients, at least some IC patients, because they block the synthesis of prostaglandins, which are major inflammatory mediators produced and released by mast cells. 
I hypothesize that this is possible. And we know that NSAIDs can help some people with itching, flushing, and other allergic E or MCAS E symptoms. One small study found that the leukotriene inhibitor called Montelukast decreased symptoms in those with IC, and this makes sense because those same researchers found that patients with IC have increased urinary leukotrienes, and leukotrienes are released from mast cells. Montelukast. Okay, so I guess I said it wrong. Montelukast. Zephylukast. 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 <laughs> Some other leukotriene inhibitors include Zephyrlukast and Xylutin, and these are prescribed for asthma and other allergic type conditions. The Interstitial Cystitis Association also mentions that there are vaginal and rectal suppositories of Valium, which is a type of benzodiazepine. You can get these compounded, or according to the ICA, you can just use regular tablets. As suppositories? I mean, I guess. I'm not, I'm not a doctor, so I'm not telling you to put that up there, but... The ICA says that this medication may be helpful because it helps relax the pelvic floor, and that very well may be true, but we also know that benzodiazepines can be immensely helpful for MCAS patients. And for me, it is an integral part, Valium is, of both my daily and rescue med regimen. Cyclosporin A is an immunosuppressive drug that is used to prevent organ rejection from organ recipients, and is also used in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis and psoriasis. Obviously, all medications should be weighed out with their pros and cons in consultation with your doctor, and they all have their toxicities. In a study comparing cyclosporin A to pentasan, cyclosporin A was more effective than pentasan at reducing the amount of urination both in the day and at night and at reducing pain. However, cyclosporin A did have more negative side effects. Cyclosporin A is also a drug that is used off-label for the treatment of MCAS. It suppresses T-cell activation and it prevents the inflammatory mechanisms of mast cells. Dr. Theo Herides has a line of supplements that he has published research on. He has a product specifically for interstitial cystitis called Cystoprotec, and it's made with chondroitin sulfate, sodium hyaluronate, and glucosamine sulfate, which are all supposed to help restore the layer of the bladder. Chondroitin sulfate and sodium hyaluronate have been shown to inhibit the release of cytokines by mast cells as shown in rat models. Do I look like a rat? It also contains quercetin, which has been shown to inhibit mast cell secretion and proliferation. I must note that Cystoprotec contains shellfish, which is a major human allergen. Yeah, so I won't be taking that. We need more studies to verify the effectiveness of this supplement. I have now listed eight drug classes and one supplement that are used to manage both IC and MCAS. If you start thinking of IC as a symptom of MCAS, or at the very least, mast cell mediated, well, now you've opened up the door wide to so many other drug classes or supplements that could be helpful in the treatment of IC. Maybe catodafin is helpful for those with IC, or maybe chromalin sodium, or zolaire, or magnesium, vitamin D, imatinib, luteolin, and more. Our understanding of MCAS is in its infancy, but we know that the mast cell can release several hundred, if not more, chemical mediators. So this is just me talking out of my ass, or to use a euphemism, conjecturing that any medication that helps prevent the release or binding of any of these mediators not only has the potential of helping patients with MCAS, but also has the potential of helping patients with IC. Piper, did you know that the antonym of a euphemism is a dysphemism? Can you give me an example of a euphemism and a dysphemism and something in between? Sure, Piper, I'm so glad you asked. So a euphemism for I urinated is I went number one, and a dysphemism is I pissed. Jake, you're informed. You just said urine. If you haven't had the opportunity to subscribe to my channel yet, I would really appreciate it if you would consider doing so and hitting the thumbs up button if you found anything informative in this video. Bye! Bye! Do you know, you knew that before no, I said that it's today? It's gooch, I didn't know why the word gooch. Was. But what about taint? I, oh, I, yes, I know. Oh, you knew, you yes, knew taint. Yes, I know taint. Okay.